at the CDC Mycotic Diseases Branch. So um, I know that Nancy's going to be talking about Canada Aris and uh, some kind of maybe WGS initiatives that are underway to detect and prevent the spread of that particular pathogen. Uh, and then Rory's got some really exciting news on the NTBI front. Is that right? On Canada Aris. Yeah, it's on Canada Aris. Okay. All right, awesome. Well, I will, I'll hand it over to you guys and you guys can take it away. Thanks, Logan, I appreciate that. Okay, let me share the screen. Hi, everyone, hope you're having a good afternoon. And thanks again for this invite. And actually, let me, okay. Um, so yeah, it's awesome to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about this group. So when we in Mycotics got the invite, we were uh, totally psyched to talk about Candidorus and what we've got going on with whole genome sequencing and molecular epi and what we're doing in the United States. So quickly, a little bit about the Mycotic Diseases branch. Um, we're a small branch in size, so we focus on fungal diseases. And uh, we're about 40 people, um, and that includes both our epi and lab teams. And we work on a variety of diseases and pathogens. So we work on healthcare associated infections like C. Oris, as well as mold infections um, that we commonly see in hospitals. We work on environmental diseases like valley fever, histoplasmosis. Uh, we work on cryptococcal meningitis that's very severe, can be very severe in patients with advanced HIV AIDS. So a variety of pathogens, both domestic and global, but really C. Oris is the only one that we routinely and prospectively sequence in the US. Um, so I'm going to be, like Logan said, telling you about all things that you need to know about C. Oris, it's epi, molecular epi, how we sequence, um, what we use the data for. And then Rory is going to be um, talking towards the end um, about some work that we've got going on with NCBI and some collaborations that we're pushing forward. So for C. Oris, many of you probably know about it. Um, this is just one of the many news articles that have come out about how this fungus, this pathogenic yeast, has literally swept the globe. Like it has emerged seemingly simultaneously in healthcare settings worldwide. Um, and it's done so in really the span of just a few years. And it's been such a public health concern that CDC last year in 2019, they listed C. Oris as an urgent threat uh, in terms of antimicrobial resistance, indicating that it required immediate and aggressive action. And thankfully, the public health response to C. Oris has been robust and it's been aggressive. Um, one of the things um, that we're grateful for is the adoption of C. Oris into the AR lab network. And so in the seven regional labs as part of this network, C. Oris identification as well as antifungal susceptibility testing occurs. And so that really helps us have uh, more rapid detection and uh, better surveillance in this country. And one of the things that we're super excited about, really hopeful for, is that we're planning to support um, WGS of C. Oris in the same seven regional labs in the coming months. Um, so this is going to be an absolute game changer, um, you know, not even only for C. Oris, but for fungal disease in general. This would be for the, the this would be the first time that for a fungal pathogen there would be a subtyping network. Um, that hasn't happened before. Uh, so we're, we're gonna have more information coming from ARX uh, and from the AR lab network, but that's something that we're excited about. And we see really like just conversations like this, like us presenting to you today and the discussions we're gonna have as sort of like the, the, the framework for thinking about, well, you know, what is CORS WGS gonna look like in the next five to 10 years. You know, right now, all WGS is happening at CDC headquarters. So hearing from you all and your perspectives is gonna be really critical to make sure that it, it works well. So a little bit uh, in terms of the intro of CORS, if, if you haven't heard it before and, and why this pathogen is so concerning. So CORS typically affects the sickest of the sick. Um, so these are patients that may have a tracheostomy, ventilator dependent, they're probably colonized with other MBROs, 
And we really like to emphasize that seahorse is not a threat to the general public or otherwise healthy individuals. It's really patients that are battling other diseases, other conditions, and in their very sort of vulnerable state, CORS can kind of swoop in and cause a very severe life-threatening uh, infection. Uh, and this is something that we're acutely aware of during the current times, obviously with COVID-19 and with one of the severe outcomes of, of COVID, um, that it can be ventilator dependency. And uh, something that we've observed like literally in the last couple of weeks is we're starting to see outbreaks of CRS in settings that we wouldn't normally see outbreaks um, in. So normally uh, we see CRS in LTACs, long-term care facilities, and we've started to see a couple of outbreaks in acute care hospitals in the COVID units. So that's something that um, we're just trying to understand right now and, better, and get a, a better grasp on. Um, okay, so then if you're thinking about like candida species and like, okay, well, you know, I know candida alcans and I know gabbrata and I know proxylosis, like why is seahorse kind of so unique and why is it um, such a, a public health concern? It's unique for a few reasons. The first is that we know seahorse can colonize the skin. So it colonizes patient's skin and this can develop into an invasive infection, like a bloodstream infection. That, coupled with the fact that seahorse can persist on surfaces, uh, so it can stay alive on surfaces in the healthcare environment for a span of weeks, really allow it to spread rapidly in healthcare settings. So we do see transmission of seahorse, which we don't see for other Canada species. And then on top of all of that, seahorse is highly drug resistant. So the rates of drug resistance that we see in seahorse, we don't see that in the other candida species. And when thinking about fungal diseases in terms of drugs and, and the antifungals that are out there, there are really three major classes of antifungal drugs. There's your azoles, your polyenes, which is pretty much amphotericin B, and then your kinocandins. And so for seahorse, we see pretty much you know, the vast majority are resistant to azoles, about a third resistant to amphotericin B, and very little, but we do see some resistance to echinocandins. Uh, in terms of infections in the US, um, about a third are multi-drug resistant. So these are cases that have a strain that's resistant to two out of the three major classes of, of these drugs. And we have seen pan resistance. Um, so uh, we've seen five cases so far. Um, this is rare, but again, you know, we've seen it. Luckily, it, we haven't seen transmission of a pan-resistant strain. So this is generally a case that's acquired a multi-drug resistant strain. They're placed on echinocandin therapy. They develop echinocandin resistance. So we haven't seen transmission of a pan-resistant strain. Uh, you know, earlier, I, before I had said how CORS is kind of, you know, just really quickly and kind of mysteriously emerged in the way it did. Um, a little bit more detail is that it was identified in Japan in 2009. And then in about maybe five years later, like 2014, 2015, we started to see an increase in CORS cases in various global regions, but sort of simultaneously, um, with the first case in the United States being reported in 2016. And then if you kind of fast forward to like, what's it currently looking like globally, um, there is over 35 countries reporting CORS cases right now on six continents. So a dramatic shift in a very short period of time. If we zoom in to what's going on in the United States, uh, this is just an epi curve looking at the clinical cases as of June of this year. You know, we're seeing a steady increase. We've got about 1,200 clinical cases total so far, twice that in screening cases. Uh, you may notice here, um, so the first reported case in the United States was in 2016, but at that point we did a retrospective look back and we found cases as far back as 2013. Now, when thinking about the distribution of, of CORS in the United States, um, it's pretty widely spread. Uh, CORS is now nationally notifiable, so that makes it one of the two uh, fungal diseases that are nationally notifiable. And this really is, is absolutely critical in the way that we're able to do surveillance in, in the country. Uh, you can see that the high burden areas are Illinois area, uh, New York, New Jersey, as well as Florida and California. 
And then interestingly, if you look at the antifungal resistance rates, they also vary by region. Um, and so if you remember those three uh, major classes of antifungals, like in terms of azole resistance, pretty much all of the regions are seeing high rates of azole resistance, except for the Illinois area with um, less than 10%. Uh, for amphoteris and B, for the polyenes, um, there's a lot of variety with the New York, New Jersey area seeing uh, the highest rates of amphoteris and B resistance. In terms of kind of candens, pretty low, but up to 3% in the California area. So a lot of variety in terms of where we're seeing uh, Cioris and in terms of the, the, the drug resistance. Okay, so that was kind of like crash course, you know, intro on Cioris. So now I'm gonna tell you about what we know for the molecular epi. Um, and this is, you know, just all the, the work that we've been doing for the past couple of years globally and, and domestically. So we know that CORS has a very strong phylogeographic structure. Um, so isolates uh, will cluster phylogenetically based on geography, what we're seeing. And we've identified five major clades to date. Uh, four we consistently talk about because for one, um, we've only identified one case. Uh, so the four that are common are the South American clade, African clade, South Asian clade and the East Asian clade. Uh, last year, around hmm, summertime, we identified um, the fifth clade in an Iranian case, uh, but all other cases globally fall or cluster within these four major clades. The other thing that we'd like to note is we're trying to move to a more um, numeric nomenclature uh, so you might notice that, like if you go back and you read past publications, um, we're, we're trying to do this sort of awkward transition. Um, but, you know, it could just get a little confusing because, you know, there's just mixing. There's global travel happening. And so if you have a case, like a South African case, and their isolate clusters to a South American clade, like that can get kind of confusing. So we're trying to switch to the clades one, two, three, four, um, and, and that's just our current transition. Uh, so here we're looking at a phylogenetic tree and what you can see is that the clades, they're tens to hundreds of thousands of SNPs different. So very genetically distinct. And then when we look within a clade in terms of SNPs, we see that if we've got, you know, multiple isolates from multiple countries, you know, we're seeing on the order of like 500 to maybe 2000 SNPs different within a clade. So um, between clades, very genetically distinct and within not so much. Um, we've been able to do a, a few studies, some molecular epi surveys uh, in, in the US looking at cases between 2016 and 2018. And one of the first findings that we had, like the biggest finding is that we had seen all four major clades um, in the US. And, even to this day, this is still pretty unusual, and, and, and the United States was the first one to observe all four major clades. Um, and even uh, Florida, uh, Florida State has observed all four major clades. Um, other things that we found uh, through, through the molecular epi is we've been able to describe the transmission dynamics. Uh, so we've been able to conclude that CORS cases are a result of introductions from abroad that, you know, when um, they arrive, they're followed by local subsequent ongoing transmission. So the majority of CORS cases in this country, they don't have a direct link to healthcare abroad. It's local transmission that's happening. Um, and this is something that, you know, when we saw sort of this rapid, um, Spread and, and we kind of were looking at the epi, we quickly realized that like we just couldn't sequence all of the isolates. So we can't sequence all the isolates from all of the cases. And so we've come up with a priority list to kind of help guide the selection by which we do this. And, and this has just been something that's worked for us. Um, so a lot of the work that we've done is, is sequencing a single isolate per clinical case. Um, maybe we'll uh, sequence the first isolate from each facility when it's reporting CR so we can have that representation. Um, isolates from patients where their epi is pointing to an exposure to healthcare from abroad. 
Um, and then just special circumstances like an active outbreak going on or pan resistance. So this is something that works for us. And I'd be interested in, in just hearing thoughts and, and thinking about like um, when, as we are planning to, to roll out CRS WGS to, to regional labs and, and what that would look like at the state level and how, how would other sort of groups kind of figure out their priority list. Uh, another thing that we like to emphasize, and this is just not, you know, this isn't specific to CORS, but we find that the WGS data, like when we're doing these phylogenetic trees and using them for the investigations, they help, but they do not replace an epi investigation. So generally, like one of two things is going to happen. You know, it's going to corroborate the suspicion that we got going on in an investigation. So there's, you know, a patient. Um, they've acquired CORIS, the EPI's pointing to something, um, you know, maybe they got from this facility. And because we have a pretty good database of what's going on, we can say like, okay, the EPI and the WGS, they're corroborating one another. Uh, sometimes uh, the WGS data will refute the hypothesis. Um, and this is going to help us figure out, okay, well, in the field, when we're targeting our resources, to, to do additional investigation, this is where we need to put it. Um, and maybe we'll find a spot or an instance of CORS transmission that we didn't know was going on um, otherwise. The other thing uh, we wanted to talk about is interpreting SNP numbers and, and how you do this in the context of transmission, because it can be really difficult. Uh, so zero SNPs, like, okay, that generally means what we think to mean. Uh, 50 SNPs, okay, that's pretty, I guess, easy. But then, you know, where's that gray area of like a couple of to five to 10 SNPs? So one of the things that we kind of learned from our TB colleagues was, well, if we could sort of think about the genetic diversity within a person, maybe that would um, shed light and be indicative of the type of genetic diversity that we see in a transmission event. And so what we did is we took multiple isolates from a single case, we sequenced them, looked at the average SNP difference, and then we did that for multiple cases. And then we plotted that distribution and we found that the median SNP difference uh, was three SNPs. I actually can't see, okay, here, yeah, the faces were on the three, so it's actually two. <laughs> The other one is three. Anyways, so median of two SNPs, range of zero to five. Um, and then if we looked at the genetic diversity within a facility, so we had some really great partnership with the facility where they were doing robust screening. They were also doing admission screening. Um, and so what we could do is we could figure out like, okay, these patients arrived into this facility and they were CRS negative. And during their course of stay, they acquired CORS. So we were able to take those isolates, sequence them, you know, look at the SNP differences, and we saw a median of three SNPs with a range of zero to 12. Um, so that was similar to what we were seeing um, within person. Um, and so are we saying like, okay, two, three SNPs, hands down means transmission? Like, no, we do, we're not. And I know everybody on this call gets it more than others in terms of like, it depends on your methods, it depends on your reference. And it also depends on just your local context, like what's going on with the genetic diversity in your locality. Um, but this is something that we were able to do to kind of, you know, give us some data to help guide our interpretation. So th something to think about. Uh, okay, so in terms of the actual sequencing and SNP analysis, like how we actually do it. Um, the vast majority of sequencing we do, no surprise, is, is, is short read using Illumina. Um, here I've just got some pictures of the kits that we, that we use for DNA extraction as well as library prep. Uh, we use a Zymo kit for DNA extraction and we've been using NEB kits. Uh, we did get some good feedback recently about looking at other library prep kits, especially ones that are usually used for um, maybe pulse net organisms or other HAI organisms. So that's something that we're trying to think through because we, we would definitely want to just, you know, standardize and, and, and not be like that unique in that area. Um, and then most of the sequencing we're doing is, is on MySeq using the 500 cycle kit. 
And when I say we, it's like, it's not really us. It's not really the mycotic diseases branch. We have an amazing CDC core facility, the genome sequencing lab, like just a great group of people that like the quality and the consistency of their data is awesome. Um, so I've just got a little bit more details or I could get more details if you're interested in like the sharing of DNA and the library prep and normalizing and pooling. Um, did want to note that most for our high throughput sequencing up until now, it's mostly been with high seq but that retired um, this past uh, summer in our core facility. So we're using NovaSeq now. In terms of long read sequencing, we've done a fair amount of this. Um, where we've produced uh, um, uh, assemblies using long read for the various clades, not the fifth clade, um, the more recent clade from the Iranian case. Um, but we've done this using different platforms like older as well as SQL. All of these assemblies are publicly available on NCBI. We've also sequenced um, using Nanopore. We've gotten some great assemblies down to seven contigs which represents pretty much the, the chromosomes of Seorus. And if you're wondering, Seorus is, is, is haploid. Um, but our go-to reference for our SNP analyses is one that we refer to as B8441. So this is from a Pakistani case, the sample, um, the isolate clusters to clade one or the South Asian clade. It was originally from a burn wound and um, we sequenced it by PacBio. It's got a length that's characteristic of Seorus, about 12.4 million base pairs long. Uh, this assembly is 15 contigs, and the um, annotation is also publicly available. So that's our, our go-to reference um, when we're doing this work. Uh, for our analytical flow, like, you know, once we, uh, we prepare the DNA, the core facility um, sequences, we get our raw reads on our shared space. The first thing we'll do is um, do a quality check of the raw reads. And so we'll look at average FRED score, average genome coverage. We'll also look at GC content just for an indication, like a quick screening, thinking about bacterial contamination. Uh, we then filter and trim our reads using PrintSeq. And then till now, we've been using this pipeline that's been developed by our partners at TGen North. Maybe a lot of you have worked with, with TGen um, and they developed a, a pipeline called NASP. Um, that's really a wrapper and you can kind of employ a lot of different things. So we use BWA to map the reads and then we use SAM tools to call the variants. And then this will generate a FASTA file. And probably one of the most conservative kind of filtering parameters that we have is that um, for any position where there's a variant, 90% um, of the reads mapping to that position have to have that variant. And so, you know, that's a cutoff that you can just kind of tell and ask what you want, but we use 90%. Uh, and then we'll plug that fast day into mega and we'll generate maximum parsimony trees. Another thing that we're thinking about, especially as we kind of transition to this this era of like decentralizing CURS WGS sequencing um, is, is maybe we'll shift to, to neighbor joining trees just when thinking about computationally like the more samples that you're getting. So this is something that we've also been thinking about and we want to do some comparisons, um, you know, factoring in the epi data to, to see what we find. Um, other things uh, in terms of uh, what we're actively trying to modernize with version 2.0, if you will, we'd like to implement some camera based tool like Kraken uh, to better detect and, and characterize the contamination. We'd like to substitute GATK for SAM tools for our variant caller. And then uh, it's been a priority to implement, um, you know, dynamic visualization of phylogenetic trees, either through MicroReact or Microbe Trace. And I would say in the last like month or two, we've started to use MicroReact as like the primary way that we share our trees. So we don't even create a PDF anymore. And it's been going really well so far. So um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but one of the biggest developments that we have is um, we're developing and, and really currently validating a pipeline called MycoSNP. Um, so our CDC scientific computing team, they've been absolutely amazing and um, they're developing uh, this for us using a workflow engine um, gene flow that they've developed. 
Um, and so this is going to do the QC, the read mapping, variant calling. Um, we're, we're planning to make this available on GitHub, Docker Hub, but we're also thinking like, how would it work for states to use it? Like, is it something that, you know, um, partners will download and use on their own infrastructure? We've been talking to SciComp about, um, you know, will we deploy it on the CDC bioinformatics platform and then users can kind of go in and, and use CDC's infrastructure? Like, you know, this is just all thoughts that we want to hear your feedback on. So thanks to SciComp team for this. Uh, okay, and then, so this is where Rory's going to come in and, and talk about some of the exciting work with NCBI for CORUS. Uh, and then I think, yeah, I think that's what you're, yeah. Rory, do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah. And there you let go. me know when you're able to see the presentation on my end. Good. Okay, um, so I'm Roy Walsh from the Mycotic Disease Branch. I'm happy to talk to you about CORUS as well as the NCBI pathogen detection portal. Um, this is a, a pretty- hey, hey, Rory, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you swap the presenter view versus the, yeah. the presenting view? Thank you. All right, is it better now? Yep. All right, perfect. So uh, NCBI's pathogen detection is a, a pretty powerful centralized resource. Um, it's publicly available online. Um, it was originally conceived and developed for foodborne uh, diseases. And um, just for FYI, the mycotic disease branch is uh, housed within the division of foodborne, waterborne, and environmental diseases. Um, and so we have these uh, kind of yearly de delegations with uh, CDC folks and NCBI that get together and, um, you know, we kind of petitioned NCBI to potentially include um, CORS. They're, they're constantly building out the pathogen detection. Uh, and so CORS is the first eukaryotic fungal pathogen to be included in the pathogen detection. Um, you know, you can see salmonella down here with over a quarter million genomes. CORS has about 800. Um, our mycotic disease branch has uh, contributed over 600 of those genomes. Um, just another kind of overview of it, it's a free web-based portal, integrates the genomic sequence data. It also takes in metadata and antibiograms. Um, it assembles, annotates, and clusters those genomes together to facilitate um, analysis, data visualizations, and aid in our traceback uh, and outbreak investigations. Um, and really pairing that phenotypic data like the antibiograms with the genomic data really enables a lot of uh, antimicrobial resistance informatics. This is something that's pretty well developed for our bacterial pathogens, but for fungal pathogens, it's, it's something that's still under um, active uh, investigation. Um, here's just kind of a, a overview that NCBI put together for how the data flows in. You have a distributed network of labs, multiple federal agencies, as well as uh, state public health and academic partners submitting to NCBI. That data can come in in multiple routes, assemblies through GenBank, raw reads through SRA, and organizational structures. Um, and NCBI has its own QC pipeline that Nancy uh, mentioned, which, which mirrors kind of what we have at a um, mycotic disease branch. Uh, it does the assembly, clustering, snip typing, and uh, builds trees and, and gets those reports out in a really uh, remarkably timely fashion within you know overnight or 24 hours analysis. And then they're publicly available. Uh, for anyone to access. Um, and so why is this important? Uh, this is from the recent AR threat report. Um, we, we've already mentioned, mentioned previously that we've had multiple documented travel related cases here in the US, followed by subsequent uh, spread through our um, healthcare facility networks, uh, particular amplification in our nursing home and long-term care facilities. And uh, we really need this data to come out in a more timely fashion. We really need to place each one of our, our new cases in the global context for what's known for, for this pathogen. Um, so here's a hypothetical example of what it looks like on the online browser. If you have a, a new case that you're investigating, um, you uh, can navigate to the SNP cluster and you have this tree viewer, which kind of acts like uh, Google Maps, where you can zoom in and out and toggle around. You have 
a table with all the metadata information, and then you have this navigation pane here. So uh, if you want to see how your new case clusters with others within the US, you can type in a search term and those will be highlighted here. Um, you will also see in your navigation pane some basic metrics, minimum, maximum, and average SNP distances between these isolates. You might have some additional epi information, such as the patient had previous healthcare exposure in Germany, and you can see how your case uh, is related to these uh, other cases from Germany, or perhaps had uh, uh, you know uh, another um, epi contact to someone who had uh, healthcare exposure in Kenya, and you can kind of see those same informations and uh, and how those minimum maximum SNP differences between each one of these isolates uh, compare just uh, all online. And more importantly, you can, with a click of a button, share this link and embed it in a report uh, with your EBI team or others that uh, you have on this investigation. You can also export these trees, these NUIC files, and um, join them in with other richer EBI data that you might have uh, using microtrace or microreact, as uh, Nancy previously mentioned. And then uh, really to, to be able to have this data, you can customize the way these labels are, but um, it's really important to have uh, correct uh, metadata in the correct fields. Otherwise, you can't really build on uh, this information, uh, how your case is built on others. If you just have kind of limited environmental other, doesn't really help uh, aid in an EPI investigation. So uh, one thing is important is you know, when you're starting out to just set up your data release policies with your minimal uh, metadata that you'll be able to uh, join in with your sequence data. And that's important, not just for the pathogen detection, but there's a host of other uh, software tools for genomic surveillance that, that will pull in from this data. Um, and so it's important to, you know, have these things well curated and, um, and entered in appropriately. And then also just for organization uh, and, and structuring the data, you can, build your bio projects and you can also have your uh, bio projects linked to umbrella projects and a bio project can be linked to multiple umbrella projects. This is from NCBI's website. And just one particular example of this, because Nancy said, this is something we're under active consideration. It's going to eventually, we're anticipating it rolling out to um, multiple regional labs and a distributed network. You might have a bio project for CORS that's linked to, we have an umbrella project for CORS, but you might be part of DHQP's HAI Seek, and you want, because this is a healthcare acquired illness, you want to link to both of those. Uh, NCBI does allow for that uh, flexibility. Um, another uh, item to consider is uh, the susceptibility testing and providing antibiogram data. So this is something that, you know, is kind of well established for bacteria. But we also have it for antifungals. NCBI has uh, included the, the same kind of structure that uh, users are familiar with submitting antibiogram data for their bacterial pathogens, now incorporates antifungal um, uh, metrics and MIC data. Uh, if you're, you can use the online tool that I was showing in this previous slide, or you can use the um, data table upload, uh, the tab separated value table and just from the pick list you, you now have under antibiotics also some antifungal drugs. Uh, CORS is an emerging uh, fungal pathogens and so there's still not uh, defined susceptibility breakpoints so currently everything will be uh, not defined in terms of the resistance type but you can still enter in the specific values um, and the testing uh, methods that, that were used. Uh, so Finally, I just want to uh, touch on some considerations for performing whole genome sequencing for CORS and uh, pathogen genomics. Um, you know, these are, are things that we're, you know, actively pursuing that work well in mycotic disease branch, but what happens when you move to a distributed network? Uh, some things to consider is, you know, how will we use this data? There's often the impulse to just sequence everything and kind of figure it out on the back end, but uh, really need to think critically, and it'll it'll probably be context dependent, uh, depending on the burden in your state, whether that's high or low. How you're going to prioritize the isolates for whole genome sequencing? Nancy mentioned earlier we kind of prioritize clinical isolates first, and then uh, the screening isolates. Um, and you know, one important thing is how how will you ensure that you're going to have the epi data integrated into this uh, sequence data so that it can 
really benefit pathogen genomic surveillance? And, and how do you ensure that you're going to have a timely release of this data in, into NCBI um, or, or others for actually having applied molecular epidemiology for this pathogen? Um, so with that, I'd just like to um, move to the acknowledgments. I mean, this is part of a, a huge group effort. We with our collaborators with NCBI, um, as well as all, all the stuff Nancy mentioned earlier, couldn't be possible without our mycotic disease branch here at CDC and our CDC partners in um, the Office of Advanced Molecular Detection, uh, BCFB, uh, SCICOM, and others. Uh, and so with that, I'll stop sharing and uh, open it up for questions and comments. All right. Uh... Very cool presentation, uh, both Rory and uh, Nancy, and very impressive Lancet paper um, up there, I have to say. Um, so I got a couple of questions um, because before I, I ducked out for, for another presentation. Um, so I noticed that the wet lab uh, sort of like uh, process in terms of isolates is first of all, uh, first go through is similar to the group A strap uh, and the uh, strap lab, Bernie's lab. It goes through like a covarious ultrasound and then um, uh, an EB library prep and um, whole genome sequencing using Illumina platform. So I think we sort of like mentioned this in a, a couple of years of CDC call that uh, the majority of public health labs is um, stick with um, like a um, uh, enzymatic sharing uh, or fragmentation of DNA, and um, the library probably is either the uh, Dexter XT or the DNA Flex. So um, I think like one key point to um, encourage all fifty states to be on board with uh, Canada Aureus is to um, uh, sort of like alleviate our burdens in terms of. Um, get on, on board and start a new library prep approach. Um, so if you know, there's any chance we can um, fully utilize what we have or in, in integrate the um, C. aureus whole genome sequencing into our current post-net uh, or, or you know, regular other virus sequencing workflow, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, so that's first. And then the second is you mentioned about the current references is based on a, a Pakistani isolates that is not closed genome. I, I guess, do we have any thoughts or plans to get a, a full genome or closed genome uh, out of uh, Canada Aureus? And I saw the phylogeny of five clades um, and they seem to be quite different with each other. And would the references choice um, is the best if just given like one um, Pakistani isolates as the references? Can we sort of like filter out when we have an isolate and decide which clade it is? And then um, using one, you know, identify one string as the clade references and then do the further down bioinformatic analysis. So that's the second question. And then the third one is, is there any correlation between the genotypic data versus the phenotypic uh, antifungal resistant drug data? Um, can we do something about the, you know, can we extract like we, what we are doing with TB? Um, you using genomic data to predict the uh, antibiotic antifungal resistant drug profiles and even adopt it clinically. So that's it, sorry. Nice. <laughs> uh, how about Rory, you wanna, we can, I, I can do one, you do two, and then we both do three type thing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I don't even know if the first one was really a question, but I think it's a great comment with the library prep stuff. And um, yeah, we've looked into using the Illumina kits, um, and I, I actually was looking at the SOP for um, that, that DHQP for HAI bugs 
um, hands out and for PulseNet as well. So I think that's a great point. I think that's something we need to do and it would be pretty easy. You know, we just uh, run some data using a different kit and, and we see if we're getting like the same thing, which I anticipate that we would. Um, so uh, if there's any sort of SOPs other than what I kind of mentioned that you might have, we would love to see that um, because we definitely want it to be as streamlined as possible with the states. Absolutely, and I think you know it's it make uh, make no sense for us to to purchase like a, I mean I don't even know the size of the equipment like the co covarious ultrasound sharing DNA sharing equipment, but it 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 make little sense for us to, to purchase and you know get net network and get people staff trained for one bug, um, so it will be. You know, if it can in line with majority of our workload, that would be great. And I think we are definitely interested to um, utilizing uh, what we have in house um, to see if we can generate sort of like comparable data set. You know, using like our our current workflows. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We we definitely anticipated that this would move outside of our branch eventually and wherever possible that we can harmonize efforts uh, we we want to to do that so that it's like you said someone not having to go through a whole new pt validation for something that this is a yeast it's um you know it is a pretty hardy organism but it's it's not too dissimilar from the pathogens and uh that you encounter through pulse net so um so th that should be possible uh i think you'd had a question about references and uh, yes, that, that should also be something until recently, we, we just didn't have, we had two um, references available uh, based off long read uh, pack bio as well as Illumina data. And we just had an initiative, uh, there, there are two separate um, collaborations that we have with NCBI and both of them required more references. So we were trying to validate the new uh, nanopore technology as well as um, we got a new pack bio instrument at our core facility. So we went from the RS to the SQL. And so we went from two to 20. And we're just uh, trying to do the last bit of validation for all these references um, and get them publicly available on NCBI. So you can imagine in the future, you would do, you know, an initial uh, quick subtyping with marker genes to place your uh, isolate within the closest available reference. And then you would run your SNP typing with that, uh, that uh, reference. And for a lot of these PacBio and Nanopore references that um, we recently generated, we have telomere to telomere uh, chromosome assemblies. So they're, they're a lot better quality than what we had previously. So it's, it's kind of timely in this uh, recent push that we make this uh, public. Absolutely. I think, you know, the uh, Oxford Nanopore uh, jumps right in time, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, uh, I mean, at least for some of the pioneer public health labs nationwide already purchased, um, you know, mean ion or, or even great ion for the initial SARS-CoV-2 whole genome sequencing. And I think we want to, um, at least the staff B wants to encourage all the, you know, public health lab members to um, at least get like uh, one mean ion in the lab. And I think that's where the trend goes. And uh, I think Canada always can fully utilize the opportunity to, you know, even to do something with, with the main ion part. Um, if it's, you know, in line with my seek, if we don't have this much throughput. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, and then to your um, third question, it's pretty much, no, not right now. Um, just, you know, fungal, um, drug resistance and mechanisms of drug resistance are just really complicated. And it's generally sort of a multifactorial thing where it's not just at the genetic level, it's also epigenetic. Maybe there's some transcriptional regulatory effects, like all of that stuff is still being, um, you know, studied. And so there's just not, like, we don't even really know, like for Amphotericin B, how that happens. So really we're hoping that by making all this data available and getting cool, smart people around, we'll start figuring that out. Thank you, Nancy. I'm totally a newbie for ease, so that was very helpful. I 
I am like Sean and I have lots of questions, but I will ask one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask about first is that um, I, this kind of goes off of what you guys were just talking about. So are there any like specific databases for kind of antibiotic resistance in fungal pathogens or those are still kind of being uh, built up and, and studied at the moment? Yeah, uh, Nancy, jump in. But uh, Marty is the the only one that um, that really has uh, both the the genotype data as well as the publications for you know the, these particular markers. And it's currently built out of uh, Matt Fisher's group in the UK, um, and they're they're the ones that are maintaining it. NCBI is actively pursuing how they would house one um, uh, within NCBI. But uh, the truth is, these uh, fungal resistance databases are nowhere near what we have for our bacterial counterparts. Right. And, you know, so much more to, to why it's so powerful about what Rory was talking about, about making the antifungal susceptibility data like available, um, you know, if we do continue to move forward with pathogen detection, um, just that people have that information tied to it. Makes sense. Um, I guess I'll, I'll open it up to the, the floor in case anybody else has questions. I don't want to monopolize you guys this time and we only have maybe seven more minutes before the end of the hour. So anybody else have any questions before I jump in again? No? All right. Well, um, so I guess my next question is, uh, is there any work being done to do kind of like de novo assembly for these pathogens or is it pretty much just reference based? Is that the, the kind of um, route that, that you guys are kind of married to at this point? Um, you mean for uh, just like our phylogenetic analyses? Yeah, and my genome reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Not from us. Um, we'd like to, to think about that. I mean, but we're not actively kind of pursuing that right now. Like what we mentioned about MycoSNP, that's reference-based and that's kind of where we're putting most of our efforts. Um, so yeah, I, I'd be interested in hearing, you know, where, what the benefits of that might be. But yeah. I don't know, Rory, if you've got something. Yeah, I mean, just, with the genome size, it's only 12 and a half megabases. It's not impossible. Um, you could do a skeezy uh, de novo assembly pretty quickly with that. Um, it's just for, for our SNP typing, we do reference-based alignment for kind of like the routine analysis, but um, it's certainly possible if you uh, wanted to build a, a custom pipeline that, that would do de novo uh, for, for your phylogenetic analysis or, or what have you. Yeah, I just wondered because sometimes with um, de novo assembly, you get like uh, a little bit of a, a different kind of nuance or, or look at kind of like a phylogenetic analysis um, as opposed to if you're doing reference based. But um, yeah, that's that's really interesting to to consider going forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to add one more point, I mean, and it kind of ties into the previous comment from Sean about incorporating uh, nanopore technology for uh, pathogen genomic surveillance. Most of our pathogen genomic surveillance tools are built for short read. And so we're, we're really missing out on that added benefit that those long read sequencing technologies have. And just as soon as that data is available and we can validate it, we definitely want to incorporate it to, to get that little bit of extra information. Um, especially with this emerging pathogen, everything is so clonal that every little bit helps with these investigations. That makes sense. Uh, and then you guys were also talking about uh, plasmids. So the, this organism does have plasmids and is that typically a, a mechanism that you see in resistance? Like, or uh, are the plasmids pretty stable in the organisms or is it something that, that is kind of variable between like the different clades or something like that? Um, I'm not, I think maybe, maybe, maybe one of us misspoke, but no, there, there's no plasmids um, with seahorse that, that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, I don't even know if there's any fungal pathogens where 
like plasmids are playing a role in, in, in some sort of like um, drug resistance. So yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe we misspoke or, or had a typo on a slide or something. I might have misinterpreted it. Yeah. Logan, Logan, this is Baha from uh, Nebraska Public Health Lab. And uh, just for the plasmid, I don't think any uh, candida aurus like really encode uh, plasmids. And generally speaking, even in bacteria actually, you see plasmids way more common in gram negative rods versus gram positive. Mm -hmm. Because with the cell wall uh, thickness in gram positive, it makes it more difficult for the plasmid to move in and out. And with the uh, eukaryotes like uh, candida aurus, it will be also more difficult for it to move in and out. So it, I will be shocked to, to see uh, plasmids in uh, candida aurus, but I definitely, well, I would love to see it. It will be a New England Journal of Medicine paper for sure. You know, yeah. yeah that Thank makes you. Sense. Yeah. I, I must have just missed. <laughs> now we probably had a typo. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I'd love to hear about from folks perspective, just because I'm so much in the, the fungal world is um, in terms of like data release and like sharing, um, you know, raw data um, on NCBI, what sort of like the timelines that happen for different pathogens? Like, I guess pulse nut's the big one. And I, I don't know, is that immediate? Like, uh, what about like other organisms? Is is there sort of like a recommended time practice? N N Nancy, like, do you mean when you submit a project to NCBI or I really didn't understand what you meant by your question? Like for the various labs and, and maybe it's the same for, um, you know, uh, well, no, it's probably not. But when you have the the raw data, um, what sort of the timeline, like how fast does it generally get on NCBI? Like how fast are you sharing data for various bugs that are handled at the States? Oh, okay. Like from our hands, like when we submit it, it's within like a few days, it's available in uh, NCBI uh, database, unless you specify, because when you apply, uh, submit this data, it will tell you when, when you want this data to be published or be public, uh, public. So either you say immediately and it will take them 48 to 72 hours to be available and sometimes less than that. Or you say like after six months or whatever date you, you, you put. So it really depends on the lab that's working with this data, how fast they want it to be available in the NCBI database. And I think a, a lot of labs are pretty much just kind of using the, um, I mean, I, I know a lot of labs are, are submitting PulseNet data and they're just kind of using like the Bionomerics kind of infrastructure in order to do that. So it's just how long it takes for, for that to kind of upload. Um, and in terms of, of other organisms, uh, I think it, it is really dependent on the lab itself. Because mm -hmm. um, some labs will, will upload that data, but I don't know that a lot of people are going to necessarily take on that uh, unless it's part of like another project or if it's something that has been, you know, kind of mandated or something like that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, just speaking back to that harmonization effort, uh, when we were trying to get data release agreements with our different states and jurisdictions, we tried to mirror as close as possible the um, PulseNet uh, metadata criteria so that there would be precedent and hopefully, you know, that that one little bottleneck to getting the data out into the public domain um, would be, you know, at least a little bit more streamlined. Um, and so the same thing, if uh, the data could go through similar pathways that you guys are already using, that would hopefully probably help this be more, more easy to kind of fold into the to the normal workflow that the various groups have. So um, definitely interested in that. Definitely. If you can use existing pathways, then yeah, that's going to eliminate kind of a, a hurdle that people have to jump over. Um, it is 301, so I just wanted to let everybody know and be respectful of everybody's time. If you have to go, uh, we're happy that you were able to make it. Um, this will be 
up on the Staff View website. It's recorded, and I think it's still recording. So uh, we'll make sure that this gets up on the Staff View website within a, a couple of days, probably. Um, and I'll send out a link once that's done. Um, thank you so much, everybody. If you guys want to stay on, and if, I don't know, Nancy and Rory, if you guys have other uh, commitments, I don't want to keep you guys. But if you guys have a few more minutes, I, I have a couple more questions. Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Awesome. Um, so uh, some of the the other questions that I had are, are more kind of related to like the biology, I think, of the organism. Um, just because I don't have as much uh, experience with fungal pathogens as you know probably would be expected. Um, and so I'm I'm just curious uh, with the the fungus itself or the fungal pathogen. Um, so how difficult is it to disinfect surfaces? Like, does it respond to the normal kind of like disinfection routes and things like that? Like, does it persist even after you've wiped it with bleach and, and stuff like that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can take this one. Uh, so we had to actually form an interagency collaboration with EPA because they were so slow to get, uh, you know, uh, disinfectants with, um, you know, approved efficacy um, criteria by the, the EPA. So there, th this question was something that came up in our healthcare facilities a lot, and they were defaulting to using, you know, 10% bleach, which is highly corrosive. Um, now we have a growing list of, of disinfectants. So ethanol seems to be pretty good. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway is your quaternary ammonia compounds, you're essentially just moving it around on surfaces. They're, they're not really effective. Uh, for this pathogen, um, but by and large, a lot of the other um, commonly used disinfectants that we see in healthcare facilities are, are uh, helpful. And I think I can grab from our CDC website and throw it in that comments box. But yeah, it's, it's not impossible, um, but it's certainly a little bit more hardy than your typical grand negative. Yeah, and anything generally that works for like C. diff will work for C. auris. And, um, you know, it's just it's just something like, you know, we know that bleach is effective, but like bleach can be so corrosive and it's like, you know, when also thinking about just sort of the global response in areas where like other disinfectants may be hard to come by, like specific disinfectants, like that's something we think a lot about. But yeah, there's been a lot of work, especially um, from folks like Joe Sexton in our group on just specifically looking at seawars and disinfectants. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had another question here. Uh, have there been any studies looking at how widely a community is colonized when you have something like an outbreak or, or something, you know, do, do you get kind of like a sense of where mm -hmm. it's kind of coming from and, and how many people might have spread it and how far it's spread? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to date, like, I'm not aware of any community studies that have been done, um, like any like systematic ones. Uh, and it's a question that we have, right? Is it is it in the community? Like you would you would think, you know, that on some level it is um, when people are coming in and out of healthcare um, um, facilities and exposures. But yeah, not to date that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's certainly an active uh, investigation. We know that our healthcare facilities um, that that it can be quite pervasive, but. Again, the, this is a different underlying population. We have some of our jurisdictions that are actively, uh, routinely screening their LTACs and nursing homes, and we've had facilities that have gone from zero to 40% colonized. Um, but then there's been very little look at the broader community. Um, I think uh, New York uh, Wadsworth Group uh, put out a, a study where they were looking at admission screening at some um, uh, acute care uh, facilities. and. And that's kind of like the the best indication of, of what we have. And they were picking up some colonization on admission, but again, that the population that's seeking care is different than the just general community. There was also a, a study of the Netherlands where they were um, just isolating fungi from uh, public swimming pools, and they were ident they were able to identify two different uh, CORS isolates from uh, public swimming pools. So um, they're anecdotal, but uh, it, it's certainly something that we're actively investigating. Okay, so it, it could be potentially like endemic to just the environment and it's just like 
around. Huh, interesting. Well, I mean, Rory, tell them about the, 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 the Haystack data crawler. <laughs> yeah. So uh, another collaboration that we have with NCBI is to, to kind of look, this is the emerging pathogen. Uh, we've seen how rapidly it's spread across the globe in these healthcare facilities, but the other question is just like, you know, where, where is its origin? Where did this come from? Do we have spill back from human populations into the environment? And NCBI sits on, you know, the largest repository of data with their, their um, SRA and they've moved all that to the cloud. So they've developed a tool that could kind of rapidly crawl across their metagenomic uh, data that they have and, and look for potentially interesting reads. And they were able to identify multiple samples um, that were positive for CORs or that had CR sequences. They were all human microbiome uh, samples, including a, a benchmark data set that we built for NCBI, as well as um, a human wastewater uh, samples. As, so, um, you know, it, it is encouraging that, uh, you know, that we're, we're validating this tool, trying to get it out to the public, that it could be useful, not just for CORs, but, you know, you think COVID and other emerging pathogens, the, the first question is once you identify the logical source is, you know, where else have we seen this pathogen so that we can hopefully identify, you know, the, the routes of transmission. And, you know, in an ideal scenario, we, we see a lot of the related pathogens to CORs pop up in these food fermentation studies. And that was something that, uh, you know, that's a clear, you, you can break the chain of transmission if it's just maybe don't ferment your food with the multi-drug resistant emerging pathogen, but um, there's no such luck so far. But uh, we're, we're We'd like to employ like routine prospective sort of screens like moving forward. So like we have kind of all of the past, but part of what we'd like to do with this tool is just kind of like, you know, routinely pick up stuff and then start to maybe even do some like association studies. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that they were, they were doing that. And it makes sense because I mean, a lot of the kind of metagenomic studies that you see, like, you know, you might've collected something that you didn't know uh, a certain pathogen even existed. Like you guys were saying, you know, back to 2013, you know, and you pull out like sequences and stuff like that. So it's, it's really interesting going back to like rec retrospective data and then like looking at those kind of sources. Wow, that's really cool. Um, I had one more question about kind of like the, the pathogen infection itself. Um, so it sounds like it, it can colonize the skin, but then when it actually uh, becomes an infection, is that just kind of like, it's, it's an opportunistic kind of thing where like it'll um, localize to a specific area or a specific wound or something like that, or does it become um, systemic? I think it, it depends mostly on the route of how that infection occurs. So like, you know, if, it, if it's maybe like via like some sort of like catheter, like, I don't know, maybe and it hits your bloodstream, then it's a systemic infection. Okay. Um, but maybe it is like even when we were talking about um, with that Pakistani sample for our reference, like a burn wound. Um, so I think it just sort of depends on how you like where you're sort of first exposed to it. Yeah. yeah. We, we certainly do see systemic bloodstream infections in a lot of our clinical cases. And then even our, you know, our, our screening cases, we see about, you know, five to seven percent um, convert from uh, colonized status to uh, one of these clinical infections, whether that's, you know, a bloodstream infection or urinary infection or, or, or others. So it's, it's kind of context dependent, but um, it does happen. Thanks for all these great questions, Logan. Oh, man. <laughs> I am nothing if not inquisitive. Uh, <laughs> I think most of these other ones you guys have uh, answered for me. Oh, I, I did have one more question related to the sequencing. Have you guys tried sequencing, like when you're doing it on um, like a MySeq or any of the Illumina instruments, have you tried running um, genomic data from, or uh, um, genome data from uh, Canada or with other like bacteria or like other organisms? And do you see any sort of like, um, like it playing not well with others? I, I've seen that sometimes with like some of the bacterial data, they say like you're not supposed to mix certain organisms with each other because it just like sometimes causes like problems with the data for some reason. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd seen anything like that that would suggest that you would have to do kind of like a, a completely CRS run versus like you could have like a mixed run. 
Lee, I haven't seen anything, but Rory. Yeah, I mean, uh, SUERS is the primary pathogen that we do genomic surveillance for, but we have had mixed runs with MySeq and HiSeq runs where we've had, I mean, we're the mycotic disease branch, so it's going to be other fungal pathogens that are included, other Canada species and the like. Um, and we haven't had the kind of issues that you're talking about other than the routine uh, sample mix-ups that are costly. And, you know, you, you think you're dealing with sewers and it turns out this is other related Canada species because there's just uh, switched over, but, but no. Um, I but seen, yeah. I would like to put someone on the spot who's on our list, Christina Nakumo. She's a professor at the Broad Institute and she's like, Seahorse guru. Uh, Christina, I don't know, just anecdotally, have you heard anybody have issues with, with sequencing other organisms in the same run um, with, with, with Canada Oris? I've not heard, but you guys have the most um, experience doing the, the largest number of samples for sure. We've done um, just a small number at the Broad using, I mentioned to you, Nancy, by chat, I'm using the Flex Kit, which I think was brought up as some of the public health labs are using. Mm -hmm. We've had great results with that, getting really even coverage across the genome. Um, but we've not tried mixing it with bacteria. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so nothing yet, Logan. All right. Yeah, all right. Well, Those, um, sorry. I, I, I also realized I threw these slides together with kids and all that work from home, but uh, Christina's group at the Broad is instrumental in all the, the, the latest push to get these uh, high quality references out um, for the analysis and annotation. So um, I don't think that made it into the uh, acknowledgements, but uh, it certainly should have. So um, FYI. Thanks, Rory. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, uh, take that one way or the other. It looks like it's been, a, it's been a large team effort for sure. All right. Well, I think that that's all the questions that I had. Um, is there anybody else who has any more for these guys before I let them go? All right. Well, I just wanted to, to take the time to say that this was a, a fantastic presentation and I think it just keeps getting better every time that I hear it. Yeah, I, I think everybody is really um, appreciative that you guys took the time to give this to us because this is going to be something that I think is important going forward. And I know that everybody is kind of focused right now on COVID and COVID related things. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that we should lose sight of the bigger picture that there are other emerging pathogens that are out there as well. And so we need to keep kind of our finger on the pulse and make sure that we're, um, you know, fighting things on all fronts. So this is, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. And we hope to see you guys maybe on another call or something sometime if you guys want to check out any more of the staffy stuff. Definitely. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,